Bueno, muy buenos días a todos. Eh, estamos aquí ya listos para comenzar la cuarta sesión del curso eh, del profesor Yasguan Patak sobre nanotecnología para la administración de medicamentos herbales. Entonces, pues sin más preámbulo, vamos a comenzar. Ah, hablando con el micrófono cerrado acá. Bueno, eh, buenos días de nuevo para todos los que nos están ya conectados. Bienvenidos a esta cuarta sesión de la, del curso sobre nanotecnología para la administración de medicamentos herbales a cargo del profesor Jazz Juan Patak. Entonces, sin más preámbulo, permítame que pensamos. Gracias. Gracias, Professor Caesar, for your kind introduction. And I'm so happy I uh, completed 10 days in Colombia and uh, had opportunity to visit many different places in Bogota as well as Yesterday I had an opportunity to go to Cahica and Tobio, Tabio. Tabio, and that was one of the best uh, places I have visited ever. I have traveled many countries in Europe and the beauty which I had seen yesterday is no less than any European country. It was very beautiful and I was very impressed uh, with the my travel and I have opportunities now to go to Mary Flores, Mira Flores, yeah, Mira. the coffee region, and then I might go to the northern region of the Navarra Native American. So I am really looking forward to my collaboration and relationship with Colombia for a long time. Uh, I am really glad to share with you that I am editing a book with two Colombian professors, Professor Reyes and Professor Joan Cruz. Uh, on nano drug delivery of proteins and peptides. We just got a approval from the CRC press and we'll sign the contract and hopefully next time when I come to Colombia I will get the book <laughs> for you. your university. So thank you very much uh, all and I'm really uh, enjoying my stay uh, in Colombia for sure. So uh, Buenos Dias, uh, today is my fourth lecture and uh, fourth is quarto, cuatro, cuatro, uh, cuatro lecture, advances in treatment of infectious diseases with special focus on advancement in anti-malarial drug delivery system uh, with nano applications. All the figures are taken from various web sources just to explain the ideas and concepts not to be used for sale or any other purpose except teaching. This disclaimer, I am putting it because I want you to use all my presentations, but for your personal uh, use. So, buenas dias, amo Colombia y la gente de aquí. Mi nombre es Yeshwan Patak. Actualmente estoy en in USA. Uh, soy profesor y decano asociado. I am Professor and Associate Dean in La Universidad de Sur de Florida, Canada College of Pharmacy. Estoy en Colombia como Bacario Fulbright Specialist. Uh, sincere thanks to Universidad Distrital Francisco Jose de Caldas for hosting me as a Fulbright Specialist. Uh, every time we are going to listen to this because I am told by the Fulbright people to say all these things. <laughs> My sincere thanks to Rector and Dean and other administrative heads supporting my trip here. My sincere thanks to Fulbright Specialist Commission of Colombia for supporting my trip to Bogota, Colombia. And I will fail to, if I do not mention my sincere gratitude to Professor Cesar Arroyo Ereno Fierro being my host and incredible support for making my step happy here. I am really thankful to him for that. A special thanks to Reem Abdilohum and Shannon Fleming of World Learning USA, Sergio Villamil Sanchez, Sebastian 
Bill Amidar and many others from Colombian Fulbright Commission for their kind support, Professor Luis H. Reyes, Joan Cruz, Willy Moreno, Luis Fernando Cruz, Piroga. Yesterday I spent whole day with Professor Luis, he is MD, PhD and Professor in Medical College here. And special thanks to Professor Alexis Ortiz from International Office of UDFJ DC and Alvaro Vasquez who encouraged me to apply for this Fulbright Specialist Fellowship for Colombia. Encouragement for all is so supportive that I am here. Yes, they lay fundo de mi corazón. So, apologies for my Spanish. Shall I my Spanish pronunciation, if you understand my Spanish, then surely you will understand my English also. So, I am happy to inform you that recently I had edited four books in this area. These books are published by Springer in 2020. They all came this year only. The first book was on malarial drug delivery systems. Um, second was on tubercular drug delivery system, third was on viral drug delivery system and then the rest of the infectious diseases drug delivery system. My collaborator, our co-editor, her name is Dr. Ranjita Shegaokar and she is the chief scientific officer in one of the companies in Germany and she was awarded one of the best women scientists there in Germany. And we have been working together uh, for the last several years and we have been very successful in putting up a series of books of interest. So this was our first series which is malarial drug delivery, viral, tubercular and infection. Our second series is a series of five books on cancer and landscape of cancer, different aspects of the cancer. They will be out by next year. So key facts of the malaria is that in 2021 nearly half of the world population was at risk for malaria and that there were estimated 247 million cases of malaria worldwide and 619,000 people have died because of malaria around the world and the WHO African region carries a disproportionately high share of the global malaria burden lot of people in Africa die of malaria major chunk of the people who die of malaria are in Africa and the region has, was home to 95% of malaria cases, you can imagine how, and 96% of malaria deaths. Children under 5 accounted for about 80% of the malarian deaths. Because as you get, you will see more and more information, but children who get first time malaria and if their immunity is not high, then they die. But if they get malaria for a few years, then they build up immunity and then they don't die. They do suffer from malaria but they don't die. That's why there is a high number of children who die because of the malaria. So malaria is the overview of the malaria is a disease uh, caused by a parasite. The parasite is spread to humans through the bites of infected mosquitoes and people who have malaria usually feel very sick with a high fever and shaking chill, chills. And this Mosquito grows on the water. Mostly if you have accumulation of water after the rains, then these mosquitoes grow. Yesterday while I was um, in the car traveling in Colombia, rural part, I have seen that many places there was accumulation of water on the roads also. Like half of your tire was in water. People were driving very slowly. But this water, if it in the rural area, then it will small ponds will be formed and the mosquitoes will grow and those mosquitoes will transfer to malaria and same thing happens in all different countries. In India also it is very common. So disease is common in temperate climate but now the mosquitoes do not survive in the cold weather. So in the northern America you will never find mosquitoes there but in Florida you will find lot of mosquitoes. But in Florida this water is not accumulated. Is even if it rains heavily, the water will be off the roads very quickly and they take care so that the mosquitoes do not grow. And if there is a heavy rain and if there are ponds forming, then the city will spray the anti-parasite drugs. So they spray DDT and all those things and that's why they don't, so that's why there is a very less death of malaria in America. So. 
to reduce the malaria infections world health program distribute preventive drugs and insecticide treated bed nets and protect the people from mosquito bites and world health organization has recommended a malaria vaccine which is now they are experimenting i will show you the data and then protective clothing bed nets and insecticides can protect you while traveling and you also can take preventive medicine before the travel so if i when i used to work as a young person in northeast region of india my travel bag was always carried a mosquito net so wherever i go wherever i stay i will sleep under the mosquito net because there are lot of mosquitoes in the northeast india and we have a uh, very serious malaria which is prene malaria where the mosquitoes bite you and they the parasite go to your brain and you die within 3 days oh. there is no medicine for that that's a very terrible disease so everybody there will carry even for animals we have big mosquito nets otherwise animal die of mosquito so what they do is they will put the fire and then they use the cow dung cakes and cow dung cakes they put it in the animal house and then they burn the cow dung cake so because they burn the cow dung cake the smoke comes out and then the smoke will throw away the mosquitoes and then they put the net down so that the mosquitoes will not enter in the night for the animals and same thing for human beings also so that is where the things are happening so the transmission is several factors are involved and intensity of malaria transmission concern to the human host and mosquito vectors and parasite itself and the environment so it all depends upon environment how clean you live in the house and what kind of uh, you know essential sticks like there are essential sticks or there are sticks which are used to burn I, do you get mosquito coils here yeah so those mosquito coils will repel the mosquito from the house but then as soon as you put the mosquito coil up after some time you have to close the window so that they will not come back in but it, the coil smoke is not also good for you oh. so you have to be very cautious with that and that is what uh, commonly used everywhere now human humanity immunity to the malaria goes up so if you suffer from a malaria when you are 8 years old then 9 years old then 10 years old so by the time you are 14 15 years you rarely get malaria you may get the bites you may get some chills you may get little bit of fever but you will not die of malaria because your body builds up the immunity and that is what they are trying to find out how to make vaccine from the immune immunized patients so they are trying to identify the proteins which are responsible for immunity and trying to create the vaccines for this population but children suffer a lot children do not have that immunity and those who are under 5 if they get the bites mosquito bite then their possibility of dying is much higher than the adults or uh, adolescent children and this ana ana feel is mosquito that transmit the plasmodium paramite breed in water and that is what i was telling that they breed in the water and the more they breed if you have water ponds everywhere in the village then there will be breeding grounds for the anaphylis bacteria mosquitoes and that's how they will spread so one of the best way is to dry it up if it rain and you put some soil and all the thing and do not let the water accumulate then you will not get and they grow more in the smaller ponds ponds mosquitoes don't grow on a big lakes it's very interesting so they go grow on smaller ponds within the villages and if you get rid of the smaller ponds then the chances are that's why those villages which have very good drainage system they have less mosquitoes if the drainage system is proper and then there is no accumulation of water on the road or in your backyard then automatically uh, that is that helps a lot in building up the thing and environment plays a, lot, a major role in intensity of transmission and malaria transmission is seasonal so normally when it rains the malaria starts and once it is cold then the mosquito don't survive and that's why the period is very seasonal and hence people what they do is they take preventive medicines like when i go to india what i do is i land in india go to the pharmacy and take two tablets of preventive malaria and that amodiquin amodiaquin or something like that and then that tablets help me to protect myself 
for a month. If I am staying for longer than a month, then I take another dose of two tablets. So that, that is the preventive. But because I am old enough now, and I had malaria in my childhood. <laughs> so I have immunity to some extent. But preventive medicine is the best way to do that. So recently there was a publication which came in Lancet and they were saying that if you spray the walls and close the houses and then, and then you use the mosquito net, then probably if you use a combination of anti-malarial insecticides, that helps. Single malaria nowadays, it doesn't work. So I will show how the malaria resistance have happened over the period of time. So global efforts of control are World Health Organization. Since last 150 years, the world is trying to control malaria, but they are not successful. And that's where it is a challenge. And I have several cases I know personally. One of my very good friends who was a pharmacologist, he went to Africa for some research work or collaboration like I came in Colombia. And he got the mosquito bites. And by the time he reaches home in America, he tried to get treated in America, but American doctors are not trained to treat malaria. So they didn't understand that this is malaria. And that's why the person died in seven days. They didn't get the appropriate medicine. And it is so expensive. Like I remember in COVID, hydroxyquinolone, which is like you get for one cent in India or two cents maximum. But the same thing, hydroxyquinolone, when I was trying to get in COVID, during COVID, they were asking me to pay $50 per tablet. Oh. Who will buy it? Mm. And this is where the problem is, that uh, certain countries do not have malaria, but they have no treatment. Thing. So people from that country, if they go to a malarial area, they are liable to die because of this. And non and they, know, they don't have training for that. So there is a different type of feasibility assessment they do everywhere they are working characteristic of 32 malaria eliminating countries and we'll see the number of countries who have completely eliminated 32 countries have completely eliminated malaria but their weather is responsible for that like in america in florida you will find mosquitoes in texas you'll find mosquitoes in san diego southern california you'll find mosquitoes but you will not find mosquitoes in michigan in South Dakota, North Dakota, or Massachusetts, you'll never find mosquitoes. Even though it is very green in the fall, but you don't see mosquitoes. In Florida, in my home, many a times, this is the time you cannot go out and see. That's why you have lanai's, you know, Florida, Floridian rooms. So you can sit outside, but all the nets are there. So it is all depends on the environment where you are how you are living and that really challenges. So three-part strategy is now agreed to move the world to eventual malaria eradication and every two years, three years, the WHO says we have to eradicate malaria but they haven't been successful in doing that. So 99 countries have endemic malaria. So every year they will have malaria, 99 countries. Most of them are from Africa. You will see the picture also, graph. So. Uh, and then 67 countries are successful in controlling the malaria and 32 countries are pursuing an elimination strategy, total elimination of the malaria. So 32 malaria eliminating countries span over geographic location, sizes and income and many of them have prospects of eliminating malaria within the next decade. Now it is observed that malaria is directly dependent on the economic status of the country. If the country is economically not sound, then the malaria is higher. If the country is economically sound and put a lot of money into preventing malaria, they are successful in eliminating or pursuing to eliminate the malaria. And then countries contemplating elimination should comprehensively assess the feasibility of malaria elimination. So there are a lot of people who are working in this area. 25 of the 32 malaria eliminating countries are solely or mainly fighting the battle against plasmodium vivax malaria. Now malaria is brought in by different malaria parasites. So they, you know, you may be successful with one, but you will have definition of challenges with the others. So malaria elimination has a risk and the alternative of maintaining control low endemic malaria for a long period also has risk. And many of them similar in nature and magnitude. Now you can understand the risk. If you have a malaria because of anaphylis, you know, now, if we change that, now another 
malaria and parasite comes in, your whole population can suffer from that. Because you try to eliminate only one set of insects or one set of malarial parasite. And there are several malarial parasites which can cause malaria. And this is where there is a danger. So if you eliminate only one and let the people suffer from the other, get infected from the other, then they will be liable for more death. So there is a balance which has to be done and that is where the challenge is coming into the picture. And various overarching challenges exist and include improved methods of diagnosis, surveillance, multi-country collaborations and long-term commitment. Nowadays what is happening is with the advent of cell phones, iPhone, you are, if you have a rural area where there is no access to healthcare, now they have come up with an app. So what you do is you ask the patient if suppose rural health he doesn't he is having chill and fever and all those things so they will prick their finger and then put the drop of blood on the slide and then take the picture of that blood with your cell phone and then that picture is tra transferred by your cell phone to the physician and then those physicians take that picture put it under the microscope. And when they see the microscope and what kind of parasite is existing, then they tell them to take certain medicines. And that's how the telemedicine is helping to reduce the deaths of malaria in the rural areas in Africa, in India, in many other countries. Here is it happening in Colombia. Do they do this telemedicine thing a lot for the rural area? They are not aware of it. It must be happening. So it is a very important thing that with the new technology, you are easily able to know whether the person is suffering from fever because of viral infection or fever because of malarial infection just by taking a drop of blood, spreading it and seeing under the microscope at some remote place because the picture gets transferred. And that is where these uh, interesting challenges are done. So this is a very interesting picture here. You can see most of the America is free, is controlling the uh, malaria and Canada and Alaska and all different places of America because you will find that they are very cold. They are always under 70, maximum 80 degrees and once you are above 70 degrees then the malarian parasites grow well and that is where the advantage is. So Mexico has much more eliminating malaria efforts are going on. In the Central America you have countries like Guatemala and Belize and all those Panama, they suffer from here. Now, Southern America, almost every country has high malaria thing, controlling malaria here. Uh, and you will find that if you see the graph, will show you. Guyana is one of the South American countries which has a lot of deaths. In, then in African countries, you will see majority of the African countries suffer from malaria. They are controlling malaria. Uh, in India, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan and some of the Southeast Asia, Indonesia, all these countries have a lot of water and a lot of malarial uh, infection there. But Australia is again far away and it is uh, green, not much malaria. In Russia again because of the cold, Russia, China and most of the Europe is there. So now there are uh, treatments of malaria now. They are using a very interesting uh, investigational vaccine which is called malaria vaccine and it is R21 matrix M in adjunct matrix M and they are seeing that when you inject this uh, to children in Burkina Faso they were showing very good results for the vaccine. So it is a uh, clinical trial which is going on for the vaccine and you must have heard about it that India Serum Institute uh, is one of the you know COVID vaccine mm -hmm. Pfizer had a big fight with them and they supplied the vaccine to more than 100 countries from India and uh, that Serum Institute has developed the vaccine for malaria as well as vaccine for dengue which is another very uh, dangerous disease. So this is the result of uh, recent trends of clinical studies in the, uh, this is published in 2021. So still the studies are going on and experimental work is going on for clinical studies for malaria vaccine. So now what they are trying to do is to find out the resistant malaria parasites, how we can treat them. And they are adopting the processes from different areas like anti-cancer drugs, immunomodulators, 
then uh, antibiotics. So they are trying to explore which are the good medicines for this and then they use lot of uh, cytotoxicity studies in the labs to find out in vitro screening of malaria against uh, falciparum, plasmodium falciparum and then they test it in the animal and then they try to find out how it can be transferred to the human beings. The challenge is as you use the medicine subsequently the resistance develop. So let us look at the rate of different countries. So you will find Guyana is very high in the South America and then different countries are there. Death rate of Asia uh, they have Cambodia is one of the highest rates there. Cambodia and then Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea is, has a lot of jungles. It is a very de dense jungle. So a lot of people deaths are very high in that area. It is part of the and then there is the other part, which is Indonesian part, also suffers from uh, high death rates in the... And then this is re death rest in Middle East and you will find Somalia is having a lot of Sudan, Somalia. So you will understand that most of the countries are economically backward. Yeah. They have financially no strength yeah. to build up these things. And this is very interesting uh, picture you can understand that Quinine was introduced in 1632, so at least 400 years back now. So by the time, but people used to die of malaria. So they found out that quinine resistant malaria became by 1910. Then they introduced chloroquine and paguanil in 1940, 1945, 1948. And you will find that by 1957, in 10 years, the parasite became resistant to chloroquine. It didn't work. You take whatever but it didn't work. Then they had Amodia Queen which was launched in 1951. They found out that by 1971 Amodia Queen could not treat Alciferum. And then you know gradually pyrimethamine, sulfide oxygen, uh, clindamycin, mefloquin was introduced in 77. It got resistance in 1982. <coughs> So this chart shows how the struggle is going on between the parasite and the scientist. Scientists are developing new and newer anti-malarial drugs. Parasite is becoming more and more resistant to that. And that is where this tug, tug of war is going on. This is very interesting data. And now they are using pyranoripidine which is 2014 introduced and it is still not resistant. So now the, this is the one which is uh, piperequin is there, they introduced in 2000, but they are seeing some resistance in the, uh, by 2012, 2014. Now the artemisinin, in, we talked about that uh, in the last class. So artemisinin in was developed by the Chinese lady who got the new uh, Nobel Prize. Now they created some derivatives of artemisinin and they are trying to find out because even the artemisinin nowadays becoming uh, resistant. So new drug di discovery and development for arterial antimalarial drug is a continuous effort, continuous struggle which is done by the uh, scientists around the world. Now the problem I will tell you, we have to understand this problem, very simple. Those who are suffering from malaria, and a lot of deaths, are economically backward people. Those who are eliminating malaria are financially sound. So the actual research for anti-malaria doesn't happen in those countries because they say we don't have malaria, so why to put money into the malarial research. So the people from poorer country or economically backward countries continuously suffer because they don't have money for research. They don't have money for prevention. They don't have money for protection. And this is where the tug of war is going on. So the American company, big company, they don't put money into anti-malarial drugs. So it is challenge. And that is where the companies, like if there are companies in Colombia, if they join hands with companies from Africa or companies from Indonesia and then build up a setup center for anti-malarial drug research, that will fly. Because now in Colombia, if you create an anti-malarial drug research center, and build up a drug discovery program, it will be more useful because people from Colombia are suffering. 
and that's where the government have to focus and put the effort there but the governments of all these countries do not look for their own people they look for getting help from america am i right and they try to find out the solution to get it from america how the america will give the solution because they have no problem so they say we don't have this problem and this is the challenge for drug discovery and development of anti malarial drugs and crucial targets are metabolite biosynthesis membrane transport signaling system so they are trying to put lot of effort into understanding how new drugs can be developed and as i have shown one graph about antibiotics anti cancer they are trying different immunomodulators to find out how you can build up the immunity so they have many different uh, area they are working on like k14 i ki401 or ok156 these are all experimental drug they don't tell exactly what it is <laughs> they will put a number to that so we don't know understand uh, plasmodium phosphatidyl inositol 4 oh kinase inhibitors so now they are trying to understand how the parasite works within the body and raises the fever of the body and all the side effect and this is where they are trying to understand the receptors which are responsible for the action so that they can prevent the thing then many different drugs uh, they are trying to explore for the anti malarial compounds and discovering using cell based approach nowadays because of the cyto toxicity study it is easy to do larger amount of drug discovery drug to play and explore how they can work so there are now different types of formulation product currently available in the market which is artemethar lume antamin fentanyl then arte arte sundet uh, amodio queen so they are trying to put combination of the drug to see that these are some of the combination which are readily available in the market and it is still working and now the people are moving to find out how we can utilize nano particles or nano drug delivery into the anti malarial drug and that is what my book talks about the recent trends in treating drug delivery treating malaria our book covers lot of beautiful 15 chapters covering many different aspects of research recent researches in the anti malarial drug research so polymeric nano particles are used to treat the uh, anti malarial drug and you will find here that this is your polymer and then this polymer can you can attach them ligand and all different types of thing we have already talked about that you can put all those things on this and then you can target the parasites which are in the body so this can be a targeted drug delivery to target parasites if they because when the mosquito bites you the parasites enter in the body they get into your cells and then they multiply using the energy from the cells so now there is a mechanism people are understanding the mechanism that how that parasites work in the cell and how they destroy the cell and multiply themselves and this is where these um, targeted malarial uh, um, polymeric nanoparticle can be utilized so there are some advantages and disadvantages advantages are outweighing the disadvantages disadvantages we don't know because you know suppose you put a nanoparticle and lot of anti malarial drug on it and it releases everything at one point so at that point if if it leave that active drug into your liver then you may see liver toxicity or if the nanoparticles accumulate in your lungs you may see lung toxicity so there are some challenges there because these are so fine particles that they can move into body very easily they can get into circulation very easily and they are even smaller than your red blood corpuscles rbc or wbc so always they will move around and if they get accumulated and then release the drug that may create the challenge and this is the one which is very important so there are various methods to prepare polymeric nanoparticle so use emulsification or you use nano precipitation you use supercritical solvent extraction or melting pipette so there are these are some of the techniques which are very simple and you can do that in the lab in your labs here very easy to make it but we just we we can make it but we don't know how to characterize them the problem comes with the characterization making nanoparticles is very easy but when it comes to the characterization if you want to buy a transmission electron microscopy that will be like 5 million dollars 
So the universities may not be able to afford this. And this is where the challenge is. Why the nanotechnology research happens only in big universities where the facilities are available and not the smaller universities, that is the reason. So you have many different ways of creating nanoparticles. It is very easy to do those. Only thing is characterization is a problem. So if there is a core facility developed in every country, then it is very easy to build up these uh, nanoparticles there. So drug used to treat malaria using polymeric nanoparticles are artimether. Artimether is a methyl ether derivative of dihydroartemisinin. So artemisinin was a Chinese uh, drug which has come out of Chinese traditional medicine. So that started working on the molecule of the artemisinin and then they created the derivative of dihydro uh, artemisinin and methyl ether of derivative and that is called artemether which is nowadays used for the treatment and there is the artisunate artisunate is a partial synthetic derivative of again artemisinin uh, all of them are after this introduction of that artemisinin new drug they have been developed using that and now here you can take the drug put it into polymer it can be either polymer micro particle or micro sphere so micro particle is you coat the drug with polymers. So it is a nanoparticle. It is a coating around the drug. So you use different types of uh, polymeric materials to coat the drug and form a nanoparticle. So drug is incorporated within the nanoparticle. Second thing is you take the drug, mix it with polymer and form a microspheres. And that is the difference between the so Microspheres are drug is not coated, but drug is mixed with the polymer. And nanoparticle or nano is drug is coated with the particle. That's the simple difference. And there you can get entrapped drug inside uh, nanospheres, drug adsorbed on the surface. You can get nano capsules where drug is entrapped within the uh, capsule or drug absorbed on the surface. So you can have nano capsules or nanospheres based on the physical chemical characterization of the particles. Then there is a dihydroartemisinin which is used uh, which is again dihydroartemisinin DHA uh, is a known to be one of the earliest identified derivatives of 278 artemisinin. So they have created 278 different types of uh, derivatives of artemisinin with substantial antimalarial activity used PLGA PEG nanoparticles. So they are using polylactic glycolic acid or polyethylene glycolic glycol as a carrier to be incorporated. So they mix it and then form it. Then there is a lumefentrin. Lumefentrin was previously known as benflumetol, which is an antimalarial drug with 333 belonging to the phenanthrin class, which is known to be effective against 314 malarial used as hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose, which is HPMC for drug delivery. So they use cellulose also, which is much cheaper than the uh, other polymers. So you have different types of combination they use it. So here there are combinations of used um, drugs which are used for antimalarial nanoparticle drugs. So pimaquine and dihydroartemisin, dihydroartemisinin and chloroquine phosphate, curcumin and artisunate, uh, artimether and lumefentrin, artimether and lumefentrin or chloroquine phosphate and azithromycin. And you are using different types of polymers like substituted polyphosphogens, polycaprolactone, polylactic glycolic acid, chitosan, soya lecithin and uh, cholesterol. So these are some of the things, they can be either intravenous, oral, transepidermal, ether injection method or double emulsion oral. So it depends on how you are manufacturing, you can get oral or injectable. So if you have particles which are 130 to 180 nanometers, they go intravenous because they are smaller than the RBC now and they can be injected but then they have to be uh, sterile. So you have to prepare a process for sterile nanoparticle there. And then they take rapid uptake of the drug and prolong action. So you get it, you get quick relief from the malaria. Then uh, the if there are more bigger 450 nanometer, then they are given oral, it's a liquid. And temperature and time dependent release is also. So it is all dependent upon the temp Suppose the fever is around 104, 105, then the release will be faster then it, the action will be quicker. That is how they uh, try to do it. And they, because the polymer is there, they release over the period of time. And that becomes a very uh, challenging thing. 
So I should show you that to understand that exactly. Let me show you how it gives you the really rapidly profiles. That will be we'll be able to know exactly what it means when you. Yeah. So I just draw the. So what you have to understand. So this is your this is time versus drug in blood. So when you put time versus blood is if you put a graph. If you inject, then the graph will be like this. The drug will be released very fast, and then it will remain in the for in the blood circulation. If you give oral, it goes like this mm -hmm. and it comes back. So the tablet will break into stomach, get absorbed gradually. Drug consumption will go up, and then it will be eliminated. And then there is another way. Which is if you use a polymeric preparation, then it goes like this. So this is a quick release. And this is called a prolonged release. Now in the Prolonged release, it will go up to days. So when you when you get insect, uh, infection from the plasmodium, the plasmodium concentration goes up in the body, and then it comes down, and then your body starts killing the parasite in the body. And that's where, if you have this type of prolonged release for a few three to five days. You get rid of the malaria, and that is the key of using polymeric nanoparticles, which will remain in the uh, body for a prolonged time, and that will control the release of the material and kill the bacteria there. So that is very important to understand that these uh, polymer physiochemical polymers help in prolonging, delaying the drug release, and that is what there. And there is another concept which we have. They call it as delayed drug release. So you take the drug, but it is not released, and then it is released in the intestine. And you up to two hours no release, and then it goes in intestine and it releases. And it is called enteric coating. So enteric coating is something like aspirin. Aspirin is enteric coated, so it releases the drug into the uh, intestine, and that is where that is called delayed release. So they have control release, delayed release, or prolonged release, and quick release is for in injections. Immediately it raises the concentration and then goes away. So these are some of the significant outcomes of these things. An alternative route for delivery is transepidermal. There are certain things which patches are there. And then patches will re release the drug, and that is very. You must have seen tobacco, tobacco, you know, if you have patches there to uh, um, give away the smoking habit, you use those patches there. Yeah. So this is solid lipid nanoparticle for treatment of malaria. So you will find that solid lipid nanoparticles have phospholipid monolayer, solid lipid core, and embedded bioactive. So you put your drug inside. This solid lipid layer, and then drug is protected. Now, once this nanoparticle goes into your circulation, then gradually lipid gets dissolved, and the drug is released. And over the period of time, they will form some channels here. It will not immediately go away, but it will form small channels. And through the channel, the drug will be gradually released out. So uh, this is some some sort of dissolution happens at this junction. And then the drug will start getting out of the system. So these are very uh, solid lipid nanoparticles are also used in the 
but then they have some challenges because they can orally given get through your body get into the kidney now there is a possibility of kidney toxicity if they accumulate in kidney there is a possibility of kidney toxicity or they may go in different areas may go in liver or your gi tract and do not get metabolized or sometimes they don't release the drug so there is a lot of challenges in such nanoparticle drug delivery but still the benefits are better and that's why people try to get uh, nanoparticle for the treatment of malaria so solid lipid nanoparticle for treatment of malaria they have explored chloroquine pimaquine uh, then dihydro artemisinin in uh, artemether lumefantrin curcuminoids uh, even turmeric curcuminoids have a very good anti malarial property which is readily available and we can use that uh, and it is working very well so in lot of country they use anti malarial we have um, anti mosquito creams with turmeric they work very well and that is working so zetaria multiflora essential oils these are natural oils which are also incorporated using high shear homogenization getting the nano emulsions and you can get up to 135 nanometer particle size and high protection against anapolis stephanis so you will find that these all these have specific applications against a particular parasite against a particular thing not not covering the whole malarial parasites and that is the disadvantage there so you can see how consistent um, nanoparticle size you can get 375 nanometers 240 nanometer 200 nanometer 365 nanometers and you are using nano emulsions here all solid nipin nanoparticle so water in oil double emulsion solvent diffusion high shear homogenization ultrasonification and high shear homogenization these are some of the things which are widely used and ultrasonication is very easy it costs almost five thousand dollars to get an ultrasonicator but you get very beautiful nano emulsions we do that in our labs also now there is another one we had heard about this several times is dendrimers and dendrimers are also very uh, they are now coming up with first generation second generation third generation dendrimers where there is a core and core can carry the drugs and then you can at again attach uh, internal cavities are there and inter interior branching is there so those branches can be utilized so you have different uh, dendrimer they are using it for anti malarial drug like pamum is polyamido amine uh, used for tomalia frichet type ppi polypropylenemine core shell Tecto, chiral, liquid crystalline, peptide, glyco, hybrid, pamomos, polyamidoamine, organosilicon, and amphiphilic. So you have different types of dendrimers available. You can buy them in the market also. And then you can use different types of ways to put them into the system and then combine it with like pentaethyl derivatives or mesogen functionalized carboxylane, beta cosmomorphine. So these are all different types of dendrimers available in the market and you can utilize it for delivering the anti malaria drug so this is how these uh, dendrimers look like this is the core and then there are branching units and there are surface groups and there is a cavity in between so this cavity in between can carry the drugs and you can put incorporate your drug within the system and then to the branching units with surface groups you can attach ligands and all the things and then make it targeted drug delivery system for a particular asset or for a particular you know so recently dendrimers have been studied for the management of malaria study of bhadra et al poly and lysine based peptide dendrimers were used and pegamine cores were coated with chondriatin sulfate and were used to get controlled and extended release of chloroquine phosphate and the following chart shows the brief you know it's a then chloroquine was used as anti malarial drug in dendrimers showed promising applications still under study so there are many research projects which are going on and they are reporting about the applications of dendrimers but nothing is in the fda approved position these are all research areas which is happening and gradually i think in another 5 10 years they will find it out so liposomal drug delivery is another anti malarial drug so they have conventional nano carriers which are these are these are your rbc and your conventional nano carriers might be smaller than the uh, 
and uh, RBC. And then you have hepato infect, infect, uh, hepatocytes, infected hepatocytes. So these nanoparticles will go there and then they will kill the uh, plasmodium cells there. And this is how uh, conventional nanocarrier surface modified nanocarriers and infected RPCs, all these things, they are simultaneously working in the bloodstream. And if the infected RBCs are infected with your plasmodium, then obviously they have to be treated. And this is where the treatment can happen using the uh, liposomal drug carriers, conventional nanocarriers and surface modified nanocarriers. And during the circulation, they interact with each other and kill the parasites which are affecting the RBCs. Then comes another liposomal drug delivery system is very popular nowadays. You know, I remember I worked in liposomal drug delivery system first time in 1987. I was in Royal Free Hospital London. And you should know the history because there was a lady, her name was Professor Brenda Myers. And Professor Brenda Myers used to work in Charing Cross Hospital in London. She was the first person who really brought liposomes. And she died of cancer because she was trying those liposomes on her body. And she died of cancer. She was not even 50 probably when she died. But she was a very a prominent scientist who initiated the work of liposomes in the early 80s. And then I worked with a person who used to be postdoc of Brenda Raymond, who was in Charing Cross. And then he moved to Royal Free Hospital. His name is Gregory Gregoriadis. He is still alive. He is 90 years old. He runs a company <laughs> and very active, a very good friend of mine. And that was my first uh, interaction outside India. So when I worked with him, uh, we still keep communication. He is very good with computers. He is very healthy. In spite of age, he is very healthy and strong and very good scientist. No Alzheimer's, zero Alzheimer's because we interact with each other. So he still remembers me. You can imagine it's 40 years back. And um, he was very helpful to me. I always owe him because wherever I applied, I will send an email to Gregory. Gregory, what do you think? Uh, can I? Can you give me a letter? And in two days, he will send me a beautiful letter supporting. My, and I learned it from him. If you look at my emails, I have several emails. I get it from many people. I just responded to one email while sitting here. There is a assistant professor in one of the remote areas. And he was requesting me, his name is Aduha Pachao. And he's saying that thank you very much for your support and Department of Science and Technology has released a new call for application. And uh, I'm planning to submit a proposal. Can you support my grant? And I immediately respond to him that I am very happy to support your grant because I learned from Gregory. Gregory Gregoriadis taught me that if you are in a position of helping the people, you should help as much as you can. Don't worry about it. You know, and that helps. He must have changed the lives of many people, including me. And that is why I learned from him. And I do the same thing for all my contacts and students and everything. So liposomes, I worked, I have a beautiful paper in biochemical transaction on liposome uh, drug delivery. And liposomes is again it is a multi-layer lipid layer. So you have a one layer or multi layers are there, lipid layers and they are very strong. So they drug, they can incorporate your drug inside the thing and then you can attach RNA, DNA, whatever you want to attach any ligands around in the multi layer thing and they will be attached liposome. You, you just have to find out how the reaction happens and there are ways to do that. People are doing it very regularly. So some of the effort done in this regard include applications of liposome, conventional and long circulating, neutral liposome, negatively charged liposome, targeted liposome for anti-malarial, peptide coated liposome for targeting antibody mediated liposome. So you can understand that you change the structure of the polymer and then you build up different kinds of uh, nanoparticles. So liposomes as adjuvant for malarial vaccines. This is another thing which people are working on it. Uh, I am sure you must be knowing that COVID vaccine is a lipid vaccine. Mm -hmm. COVID vaccine is liposome. The mRNA was mm -hmm. incorporated into the liposomes there, the new COVID vaccine. Liposome based vaccines are for sporozytes, stega malaria, 
So there are spores. The parasites can form the spores in the body and remain there. So this type of thing can target only the spores and kill them. So liposome based vaccine for Memorozoite stega malaria, you know, so there are different types of malaria are there and different uh, plasmodium classes are there. Then there is zygots and okinitis stage malaria, so liposome based vaccine for such. So these are liposomal is very popular in the anti-malarial drugs and a lot of things are going on. So what is there is a three types of uh, levels are there. So sporozoite is there, merozoite is there and gametocyte is there. So these are the three things when plasmodium gets into the, it gets into three different layers. And then you have to have life, there is a life cycle of the plasmodium within your body. And that life cycle goes up and down. And that's why as the concentration goes up, your fever goes up. Then fever comes down. Then concentration goes up, fever comes up. And that's how the malaria fever is identified. So they are using different types of antigens and vaccine strategies are created to target, target sporozoids. Uh, merozoites or gametocytes and vaccine targeting merozoites are infected red blood cells aim to reduce disease severity vaccine targeting gametocytes aim to block transmission in a population and vaccine targeting sporozoites are infected hepatocytes and aim to prevent infection so there are vaccines for different applications you people are trying that and different types of antigens are being used for anti-malarial vaccines like FMP03, FMP04, these are the names for different types of antigens which are used for them. So there is a potential micro and nano emulsion for antimicrobial drug that is another area which is growing because nano emulsion can be given by injection or by oral and nano emulsions are simple things these are hydrophilic head compound, hydrophobic tails are there and these are called amphiphilic molecules these are the uh, they stay at the uh, interface, oil and water interface. And uh, hydrophilic hell will be outside, so it will be a oil in water emulsion. And you can incorporate your hydrophobic core drug inside the hydro, which is oil normally. And you can dissolve the antimalarial drug. Most of the antimalarial drugs are hydrophobic in nature. So it is very difficult to dissolve them in water. And that's why nano emulsions are becoming a uh, preferred way of delivering antimalarial drugs. So antimalarial drugs mostly are poor soluble, very poor soluble and poor bioavailability. So higher the surface area you provide, bioavailability will be higher. And that's why they are trying micro emulsions or nano emulsion, which provides enhanced solubility, enhanced bioavailability, improved stability, control release and improved bioefficacy. These are the advantages of nano uh, emulsion and micro emulsion. And they are using different types of nano uh, anti-malarial drug to be incorporated in this area. Then there is a potential micro nano emulsion for anti-malarial drug. So you can have oil in water micro emulsions or oil in water nano emulsion. And then these are the uh, interface surface active agents which are there. So they have explored with synchrona alkaloids, quinoline, methanol, 4 amino quinolines, 8 amino quinolines, SP, terpenes, di aminopyridine and naphthopinolone. So these are some of the very highly hydrophobic materials hard to dissolve and get absorbed. So they are using it for uh, nano emulsions. There is another area which is uh, utilized for nano suspensions where solid particle, all these anti-malarial drug fine particles are suspended in a stable nano emulsion and this is how the suspension look like. Uh, you stir it and put some polymers there and put some surface active agents and then pour, provide the enhanced bioavailability from the top to down bottom up approach is there for nano suspension. So pathobiological processes observed in human body and after malarial infection, destruction of nano infected RBCs, invasion and destruction of reticulocytes, higher fragility of both non infected and infected erythrocytes, infiltration of pulmonary tissues, heading leading to malaria related acute and respiratory so on different levels of malarial infection these nano uh, uh, suspension can be used and pregnancy associated malaria so this has the advantage of being used in pregnancy rest all of them not necessarily be used through because they may go in fetus because of nanoparticle size so splenic hematoma with the with or without trauma and so thrombocytopenia so these are some of the Nano suspension. Now, nano suspension manufacturing. This is a typical 
high shear homogenizer which is widely used in the industry also and they produce the nano suspensions and nano emulsions using where there is a high shear so the piston moves at very fast speed so that the particles are reduced i, I have used this high shear uh, homogenizer we used to use the company called gaulin so gaulin had uh, this high shear and you will get 120 110 nanometers very reproducible nano emulsions out of this Uh, and at a time you can make 20 to 100 liters of nano emulsion which is a good manufacturing because your dose is very low when you have a nano particle nano emulsion your dose is like 0.1 milliliter so 100 liter is like a million doses you know yeah. yeah so even if you make per day 100 liters it is a huge manufacturing process so and nano suspension in the treatment of malaria they are using artemether and lumafentin artesuanate and amodiapin artesuanate and mefloquine artesuanate and sulfodoxin dihydroartemisin and piperquin and they are they are they are doing all the experiments with the animal to see how the nano suspension in different levels of malaria will be utilized and they are experimenting that i don't think any nano suspension is available in the market there is another area which is called neozoons in the treatment of malaria and these are experiments are you can see from 20 2007 to 2018 various levels of researches are going on on drug basic research vaccines vector control diagnosis biologics and unspecified researches are going on number of papers which are published are um, reasonably high the cases and deaths are also higher for malaria treatment and neozoons is another new area which people are using so neozoons in uh, advantages and disadvantages of neozoons is that neozoons offer certain advantages neozoons are biodegradable biocompatible and non immunogenic so it doesn't give any immunogenic reactions uh, then it, it is unacceptable solvent do not use for production so you don't use methylene chloride or acetone or this of solvent they can be used using water based system Uh, no special handling and storage conditions are required neozoons are special uh, has chemicals 183 stability due to structural composition various properties include shape fluidity size of neozoons uh, and then you have high stability exhibited by long shelf life of neozoons and there are many drugs can be incorporated neozoons also can be easily manufactured within the lab very easy uh, only challenge is uh, characterization but the neozoons can interact with the uh, malarial parasite infected rbcs and then they can kill the parasites there so this is anti malarial drug is incorporated in different ways of neozoons in the system and they are better alternative compared to oil for oily formulations in terms of patient compliance and on the contrary neozoons show certain stability problem uh, aggregate they can aggregate if they aggregate then your dose will not be same and that is where the challenge with this uh, nano particles as well as nano uh, aggregation is a big problem for that so anti malarial drug then combination used in neomycin neozoons are artemether artesuanate dihydroartemisin and lumefantrin they are trying to use the combinations in neozoons and see if that works so challenges with malaria is that over the past 6 decade the drug resistance of plasmodium falciparum has become an issue of utmost concern you put a new drug five years resistant another new drug five years resistant so this is a major challenge for drug discovery despite the remarkable progress that has been made in recent years reducing the mortality rate to about 30% the scaling up of vector control and introduction of artemisinin in based combination therapies and other malaria control strategies are very useful they reduce the death rate by 30% almost but still there is a large number of people who are dying anti malarial drug resistance and insecticide resistance you know they used rampantly different types of insecticides and the mosquitoes and parasite became resistant to that so now that they don't you ddt doesn't work anything you spray as much as you want the mosquitoes don't die the plasmodium and the parasite don't die so anti malarial resistant insecticide resistant and other mosquito survival tactics are the clinical challenges because mosquitoes they have survival tactics they survive in spite of all these killing things 
An antimalarial drug resistance remained the greatest challenge for malaria control and has been documented for almost all antimalarial drugs in current use. And that is what I am saying that the money is not with the people who are suffering from malaria. Money is with the people who are uh, having less, they don't have malaria. So survivor of the severe malaria also face, suppose you suffer from malaria but then you have side effects and you have long term malaria effect which cover the neuro, neurological sequelae, cognitive effects and behavioral alteration. These are all, they affect your neurosystems in the malaria. And these are various different types of challenges you see in your neurological system, cognitive effects or behavioral things. So remarkable failure rates of these combinations have been observed in several African countries where resistance to one drug has been previously encountered and the case of artemether and lumefentrine. So these were very good but then resistance created. And if the malaria continues for a longer time, then people suffer from these neurological diseases and then they die. And this is where the challenge is coming up and people are trying to understand and every country has different types of malaria. And every country has different types of resistant mosquitoes. And that is where the challenge comes into the picture. So percentage contribution of malarial global deaths is India, Ethiopia, Kenya, Angola, Mali, Uganda, Tanzania, and Nigeria. They are, these are the committees, uh, countries who are contributing toward the death and then from Kenya or except India probably mm -hmm. most all the other countries are African countries. India does have some contribution in the death. So work with the best. Uh, conclusions are very simple. That this challenge is going to happen continuously. It is not going to end. Anyway, it is not, the end is not in near future. The mosquitoes will build up the resistance, the plasmodium will build up the resistance to the drug. So, biological concern all over the globe is to treat patients with safe and effective medication, avoid emergence of drug resistant malaria parasites. And the emergence of vector resistance is widely used in insecticides and parasite resistance. To first line drug including artemisinin and combination therapy has resulted in rise of malaria incidence in many endemic areas. So as soon as the resistance is developed, then suddenly there is a up, uprising of the malaria, big. And then you, you come up with a new drug, it goes down. Then the, the resistance is done, again goes up. So this is the cycle is going on. And this has called development of new therapeutic and technology approaches to combat the disease and impede the drug resistance. However, more progress and better understanding in terms of scientific research and innovation is needed to develop these novel technologies. Now the new thought which is coming up but not many people are working is to try to find out a gene which is present in that plasmodium and the one which causes the multiplication if you can clip that gene if you can take out that particular gene from the plasmodium then probably you may be able to treat but that is a far futuristic thought process which is it will take another few years to really understand what genetic structure is responsible for multiplication of this and how that will happen. So this is new technologies, RNA, uh, you know, ribonucleic acid intervention. That is where the new technology is. People are exploring stem cells, peptides, these are the new technologies they will try to find out what stem cells are responsible or what is the, you know, the RBC, not every RBC is infected. So which RBC is infected? What is lacking in that RBC? If we can identify that particular point, then we'll be able to treat that. And that is how this new technology is. So if nothing works, this is the age-old thing which will work. And that is called mosquito net. So if you prevent yourself from mosquito bites, so in the evening, as soon as the evening, mm -hmm. mosquito don't bite you in daytime. So evening, get into the mosquito net, make sure that you kill or... My whole childhood, I am from India, my whole childhood was in villages. So our job was to get into the mosquito net and then kill the mosquitoes inside the net. That used to be my business. And my parents used to make fun of us, that if you kill 100 mosquitoes, I will give you 1 rupee. 1 paisa for 1 mosquito net. So it was very interesting. So these are some of my books as usual. I will show it to you. And any questions you have, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you very much, Professor. Oh, you are welcome. Yes, one
<laughs> so we have time for some questions. Yeah. Oscar. Uh, doctor, you said that the, of the nanoparticle design uh, to against malaria depends on uh, the parasite. Yeah. The kind of parasite. Yeah. But uh, if the nanoparticle is released uh, in the disease of malaria uh, in the health system uh, is generalized, is not specific, because in the health system uh, try to uh, let the disease of a uh, low cost in the, in the sign of the nanoparticular is cost. Eh? Yeah, it is a challenge because the the new technology is extensive and it is in the experimental level. So the more you build up, like I mentioned, the gaudin, which when we bought it, when I was in Israel, that was 1.25 million dollars. Mm -hmm. Now the same gaulin is available for 250 to 300 thousand dollars. So the cost of production will go down. But it is a process. You know, everything cannot happen same day. So every technology when it is new is expensive. Like solar panels. Solar panels were very expensive in the beginning. But as China started manufacturing, the Chinese solar panels are one of the cheapest solar panels available. So the same thing will happen with this. So presently all these are experimental drugs. As soon as they get into the manufacturing level, gradually the companies make profits, some profit. And then it will come down to generic level. So any product which comes out Initially, the brand product is expensive, but then the generic product comes and it is like 10 times lower price than the brand product. Same reaction, same impact. So we are waiting for, it is always will be there that today technology is higher, tomorrow the generic product will be lower cost. And the gap between the brand product and generic product is 14 years. But it is a regular process. So every year something new will come on the generic. So it's a big market now. People are waiting for product to get off the patent. After the 14 years, immediately 10 companies will put the product into market and then common man will get it at a cheaper price. So this is a going on process. So what the government does is that like for COVID vaccine, there was nothing available. So government put money into the company to allow them to manufacture COVID vaccine. So it was not the company who were putting their money, but it was the government money which was put into the vaccine production. And that's how COVID vaccine was cheaply available. So the governments have to come into the picture because they carry, they, I pay the tax, correct? Mm -hmm. You pay the tax. So tax is to be used for our own benefit. And that's where the government... So when there is a big pandemic like COVID, all the government dump money. You know, billions of dollars were given by US government to Pfizer. Indian government gave many billion dollars to the Serum Institute. And they all created four or five vaccines. And they turned out to be cheaper to the people. And most of the vaccines were given free. You know, the first those second dose were given free because all the government was knowing that if we don't give vaccine free, millions of people will die. That is where the government come into the picture. So in all the drug development, if the number of people dying will become 2 million, then government will put money and provide the medicine at a cheaper price. That is where the thing comes. Thank you very much. There is a question in the chat. So the question is from Sophia. And I don't know if you yeah. want to open your microphone, but we can read it. I can question. talk, yeah. 
will resistance be generated to the drugs that deliver it with the nanoparticles? Yeah. What do. can we do when resistance is generated? You know, the, this is, as I mentioned, this is a long process. It has been happening since 1640. Quinine was introduced as a drug to treat malaria in 1640. By 1910, people understood that the mosquito is becoming quinine resistant. And then the science was developing in those days. So people were understanding, as I have shown you the graph, that 1940 chloroquine was introduced, 1945 quinine was introduced. And those new drugs were becoming resistant, a mosquito becoming resistant to the new drug in 5 to 10 years. That is why it is very clear that even if we put nanoparticle anti-malarial drugs, there will be a possibility that mosquito and the plasmodium will be uh, resistant to the new drug. So we'll have to come up with new technology and new drugs. Uh, there is no guarantee that if you put anti-malarial drug in nanoparticle does mean that now there will be complete, resi no resistance will be available. There is no guarantee because God is great. God will give another idea for mosquitoes to become resistant to nanoparticles. So I think it is not a um, it is not a guarantee that nanoparticles will provide you a non-resistant system. What form of nanoparticle is most optimal for delivering drugs, nanospheres, nanocapsules? This is another challenging question and I appreciate you asked me this question. It is a very good question but it all depends upon the property of the drug you are using. If your drug is highly hydrophobic in nature and it doesn't interact with water or doesn't dissolve in water, then in those scenarios, nano emulsions will be a good drug delivery system. But if it is interacting little bit with, uh, you know, some interaction with water, uh, may not be hydrophilic but not extremely hydrophobic, then liposomes and uh, other lipid deliveries will also be very useful. Dendrimers are, are are very selective because there has to be a the structure of your drug should have some open link to get attached to the dendrimer. So some open group like COOH if that group is there then H is not there then it will get attached to a particular polymer. So it will all depend upon the physicochemical characterization of the drug their chemical properties, their structures and how they can become active, interactive with the polymers to form the microsphere. All these things will depend on. Uh, so based on what type of drug uh, you want to use, so now what people do is the first thing is to try to characterize the physicochemical properties of the drug. To understand their solubility, viscosity, their interactive uh, chains what kind of chemical structure they have, how interactive they will be or how you can interact that particular drug with another alcohol or aldehyde or something like that to make it more interactive. And that way you can create a pro-drug of your drug and then that pro-drug will have different properties than your drug. And pro-drug is something which is you attach a molecule so that you can modify your drug molecule. That is called pro-drug molecule. And pro-drug molecule is, as soon as it gets into the body, the molecule which has changed the drug lives and the drug will be available for therapeutic activity. Those are called pro-drug. And this type of drug you will have to develop to put into the dendrimers or nanoparticles or nanocapsules. So it is all, uh, I normally recommend that if you want to do research, then you go from known to unknown. So what is published by the people, try to find out whether that will be useful to you for your drug molecule or drug model or not. And this is how uh, the things can be manipulated. But again, uh, it is all dependent upon your expertise in how to use the molecules and your lab facilities available to do that. When is the better? Oh, I answered that. No? Which, yes, which, yes. What route is most effective delivery? You know, everywhere, if the fever becomes very high in malaria, they use in, uh, injections because intravenous injection is the fastest therapeutic treatment available and you immediately reduce the concentration of your 
spores or your malaria malarial parasite into your system so if it is affecting your rbc then injection will be intravenous injection will directly provide the drug for interaction with the uh, destroyed rbc and that is one of the best way then comes if it is not severe then you try your oral and your other uh, ways of route of administration because uh, if the person is dying then you definitely have to give injection you must have seen that uh, if there is an accident what first you do is you put a drip you add the oxygen because these are the two things which are necessary for survival of the person same thing happens with the animals uh, human beings also that if you suffer from malaria and the concentration of parasite grows significantly up and your fever goes to 105 106 then no other thing than intravenous will help or otherwise the person will die and this is where the physician will make that decision when the better moment to use this treatment and if the sickness is advanced it possible the better moment is to prevent prevention is always better than cure if you are going into an area where there is a high malaria incidence you take the preventive medicines and that will protect you you make sure that you always sleep in under the mosquito net so that the mosquitoes will not bite while you are sleeping because they will not bite while you are awake because you can kill them if they touch your skin and you hit it they die before even pricking in so this is where preventive measures are the best way of treatment using preventive medications using mosquito nets using mosquito repellents using mosquito coil so that your interaction with mosquito will be less and lesser and that will provide suppose you suffer from the malaria then first thing is to run to the doctor to get the anti malarial drugs which will help to control the malaria if you do not do that immediately then your body will succumb to the malarial parasites and their concentrations will go beyond the control of the anti malarial drug and then you may get cured but then you will have neurological problems you will have cognitive problems you will have long term problems of malaria post malarial problem so first is prevention second is use immediate treatment so that you can you will not go further in the uh, in the disease and third thing is that avoid as much as possible interaction with mosquito and make sure that you because the mosquito which bites you and if you have malaria then it is very easy for your family member to get the malaria because that mosquito will bite another person and it carries the plasmodium and this is where the contagiousness of malaria is so important that one malarial patient in the family you will find everybody will get malaria within no time and that is where the prevention becomes a very uh, immediate thing like covid what we did was covid we isolated the people same thing if we can do in malaria if a person has malaria then put him in one room do not interact with that person for at least 3 4 5 days till he comes back to the normal stage and that will help in preventing malaria for the other people i hope i answered your question if you use nanoparticle as a treatment how can i avoid the nanoparticle pain phagocytosis before doing the function that is very true and it is a big big challenge for the nanoparticle treatment but normally you know uh, nanoparticles when they are injected you know, nowadays there are 35 40 products in the market there are around 300 and 350 products which are in clinical study for nanoparticles and they are all studying how nanoparticles get distributed into the body one of the major challenge is to identify the distribution and what are the risk involved in using nanoparticle that is why if you say suppose you are applying for a permission from us fda as soon as you say that it is a nano product they will have 100 to 1000 questions they will not approve your product very quickly it will take more years than the normal product because there is a lot to learn about nanotechnology a lot to learn about nanoparticles in the body there are very few animal models to understand the nanotoxicity in body and that is why i have a, i have a graduate program i teach every year in the fall semester which is called as risk management and nanotechnology so how in manufacturing area 
if you get exposed to the nanoparticles you may die because those particles can go in your body anywhere if you are working in silica manufacturing lot of people in the coal mines die because the finer coal particles are nanoparticles and they accumulate in your lungs and as they accumulate in your lungs your lung capacity gradually becomes lower and lower and then you die so nanoparticles is a great thing but we need to understand more and more about it so as if you are young and if you would like to get into this in research it is a fantastic area of research and it is growing area so there is opportunity to find out animal models what is the race how nanoparticles get distributed in the body there are several areas where still there are lot of researches are to be done and there is a potential research in this area okay well uh, it seems there is no more questions yeah. so it's it's no, thank you very much goodbye especially professor pata for yeah muchas gracias we conference okay. your, your, your lecture so thank you very much and see you tomorrow everybody at 10 sure yeah. yeah thank you very much i look bye forward bye. to meet you all bye the clinic with the nanoparticles uh, depends on the diagnosis uh, because a big set of the nanoparticles uh, to treat me against uh, malaria. Uh, what is the, the diagnos diagnosis test? The blood? What well, with the blood is necessary uh, is enough uh, to determine the nanoparticle that is uh, entering the wall? Yeah, it's, you know, the, we have to understand the, how the malaria happened. So you have a class now? So the first is the mosquito bite. It introduces the plasmodium falciparum. Once that introduces that parasite, interacts with your cells and the RBC. And then they start infecting and while infecting they multiply it's like you know your mrna virus mrna virus introduced in the body gets into the cell and then it multiplies mrna virus is a not live virus but it enters in the body and then it becomes active and it multiplies and that's why it will accumulate in the body and then affect your lungs then people you know same thing with so now once it gets into it it depends on your immunity suppose the same mosquito bites you and professor mm -hmm. caesar and me and him our we are four different human beings our four different immunities so my body may resist and it will not allow the falciparum to grow and i will not show any symptoms but your body will show the symptoms like increase in fever. But then your as soon as you get that up, your body protection system, immunity system, will fight back and then reduces the concentration of falciparum in the system. So you will get a fever for one day or two days and no more. Now, Professor Caesar, that immunity is very low. So, he will see the frequency of malarial fevers and seizures and all sorts of things for few days. But by seven days, his body also will resist and go back. But his body has no immunity because of some reason. We don't know. And then he starts showing neurological problems, here problem, community problems, no drug works. So it all depends upon individual person. It is very difficult to understand because every person has very different immunity. Every person has different. For COVID, hmm. millions of people got COVID, but they recovered. But few million died. Hmm. Why? Because their immunity was not strong enough to fight the MRNA. And young children, children did not show any symptoms. All young children, no mm. vaccine because 
the mrna virus was growing in older people more than the younger people didn't show very few the percentage of people below 50 was very few who died percentage of people who died above 60 was much higher because over the period of time as you age your immunity also goes down that's why you have so many diseases that's how the so the best part is immunity how you boost your immunity using nutraceutical immunity boosters natural product like turmeric helps you in curcumin curcuma helps you to build up immunity ginger helps you to but mm. then you have to eat it every day because if you are continuously eating ginger every day i have seen i used to work for a company so that company used to have a container hot water container they used to every day put fresh ginger and everybody will drink ginger water people were healthy it was cheaper than providing because people will take holiday if they get cough and cold this was a cheaper version of treatment simple thing that's how it works okay okay our time okay. is done yeah thank you very much again hey you are See welcome you. always i am so happy to be here See you tomorrow. Yeah, it's coming. So my afternoon is free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. So what happened with our good friend Ray Regis?